This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 211 was recorded on March 18th, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode of Macro Voices is brought to you by TopTradersUnplugged.com, a podcast dedicated to quant and rules-based investing, helping investors overcome behavioral biases. And by my own vacation rental on the coast of Maine, which I'm repurposing as a COVID-19 safe haven for families who want to escape city life for a few months during this crisis. What a week in markets. After the Fed's epic emergency intervention last weekend, we needed to get a Fed policy guru on the show this week. And with bond yields backing up to the surprise of many investors, we needed a fixed income guru to help us diagnose what's going on, particularly with respect to whether or not the long-feared phenomenon of both stocks and bonds selling off at the same time is finally upon us. And clearly, we need an expert on the coronavirus numbers to keep us abreast of the core driver behind all of the fireworks in the market. There's only one man on earth who is all of those people in just one person, and that's Bianco Research founder Jim Bianco, who joins me as this week's feature interview guest. We'll cover the COVID-19 projections, bond yields, monetary policy, and much more. And be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment, when Macro Tourist newsletter author Kevin Muir returns to talk to us about what just happened to gold mining stocks and what we can expect next. I'd also like to thank everyone who's donated to Macro Voices in the last couple of weeks to support our additional content during this crisis. We got our first $5,000 donation this week, along with quite a few $250 and $500 donations, and we really appreciate your support. Your generosity directly enables adding additional episodes during this crisis, such as yesterday's COVID-19 update. And I should also mention, for the benefit of listeners who only get notice of our podcasts from the Research Roundup emails, you're only getting notified of the weekly Thursday podcast in that email. We've actually had about five episodes in the last week, so if you've missed them, please be sure to go to macrovoices.com and catch up on all the episodes that you missed. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, you already did a full hour-long COVID-19 coronavirus update, which you released on Wednesday afternoon. But for anyone that missed that, please give us the Reader's Digest version of the virus update. Well, Patrick, I think we'll make this a tradition going forward. I, I've got so much to say every week. I'll probably do a, a long podcast just about the COVID-19 situation. I don't know if it'll always be on Wednesday, but we'll get it out before the regular Macro Voices podcast so we can keep it short here in the market wrap. The good news, Patrick, is at least according to Dr. Steve Bickle, who was kind enough to give me a phone consultation, Dr. Steve thinks I probably don't have COVID-19. And for any confused listeners, I explained in yesterday's podcast that perhaps I do have COVID-19. It seems like I've got a lot of the symptoms. Now, what's interesting, Dr. Steve thinks that I really don't. He says it sounds to him like a tracheobronchitis, and he says the symptoms are different, not really consistent with COVID-19. But here's the thing. I got an insane number of emails and tweets from listeners saying, yeah, I got exactly the same symptoms that you described in yesterday's podcast, particularly that burning in the chest, that feeling of a, of a persistent burn underneath the sternum, the chest plate. Never had that when I got sick before. I got it exactly the way you described it. One of the people who said that was Lenore Hawkins, who is at ground zero in the center of the crisis in northern Italy. So I think the jury is still out. Good news is probably I don't have it. I've got something else. But boy, is there another bug going around that everybody, I got emails from from Ireland. I got emails from Italy. I got emails from Australia. A whole bunch of people have the same symptoms I do. And is this the symptom of a mild COVID case or is it not? I guess the, the jury is perhaps still out. 
The big news, Patrick, this week that's freaking everybody out is the Imperial College study out of the UK. I'll give just the executive summary. There's not a whole lot new here for Macro Voices listeners because Dr. Chris Martinson told you almost everything that it says back on January 30th. The thing is, this is mainstream now. It's got the attention of the White House. The White House was not listening to Chris Martinson on Macro Voices on January 30th. So it seems like they're finally waking up. I think there's a lot of things they still haven't woken up to, and I don't think that the world at large really has their head around the full extent of this crisis. I'd encourage listeners to listen to the full-length podcast that I released yesterday where I go into all of the reasons that I think what's about to happen is probably quite a bit worse than what the general public has begun to come to terms with. There's more and more evidence in my mind that the market has only just barely begun to price in what's coming. I think we're at the tip of the iceberg moment, and I don't think the crisis has really even gotten started yet. Now, at the same time, it does seem like a lot of market sentiment is, okay, this must be the bottom. So I think there's a good chance that we're going to see a relief rally here. Uh, I don't think it's the final one. I don't think the final bottom comes really until late May, early June. That's about when we should see the viral pandemic itself peak, and that would be when the most pain is in the system, and that's when I would expect markets to maybe actually bottom. So, Eric, let's talk to S&P 500. On Thursday, we hit a low of uh, 2262 on the S&P, and more or less, each day of selling in the last three, four, five days seems to have some sort of intraday reversals, and even though we haven't really seen a big bull breakout in any way, it seems like the selling is at least tapering. What's your take on all of this? Well, Patrick, what I see, you know, I am short S&P futures now. I don't usually trade stock index futures. And the volatility is just amazing to me. Every time, you know, the president today had a press conference where he announced that chloroquine is an effective treatment against the COVID-19 illness and that that's an important development. Well, Chris Martinson told us that in his videos more than a month ago. There's no news here. But, you know, the market is rallying like crazy. I don't think the markets have really begun to price in what's about to happen, but I'm seeing more and more signs that maybe the market thinks the bottom is in and perhaps we're about to start a big relief rally. Really looking forward to talking to Kevin Muir because last time we had him on the show, I said, I don't think the bottom's in. He said he thinks it's time to buy. He was right at first, and then he called the top, too, because he was right for a week or two, and then he said, okay, I think this is the top. He put that out on Twitter, and that just about was the market top. So I'm very, very curious tactically to know what Kevin is thinking. In the end, though, I don't think the, the market actually bottoms until the end of May, beginning of June. All right, Eric, let's move on to the U.S. dollar, because for the longest time, we were like, oh, there's nothing new to talk about on the dollar. But I mean, the last month, we not only had an extraordinary drop in the Dixie, but now we've had this uh, face ripping rally that basically has sent the dollar index from its 95 lows to now uh, almost at a, to the 103 handle. And it just seems to be uh, gaining momentum here. What's, what's your take on all of this? Well, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I I made an admission on the podcast and I said, okay, folks, I guess I'm just good old fashioned wrong. I don't understand this. And I made a joke. I said, you know, it'd be tempting to explain this. It's just the, the market participants are too stupid to recognize that even though the Fed just made an emergency rate cut, which could be considered dollar negative, that they did it for a reason. And that reason is an incredibly dollar positive story. And, and I, I made the joke saying, well, if I, if I said that, I would probably just sound like some guy trying to justify why he got it wrong. You know, I'm coming back to that story. I think that's what's happened. We had the Fed rate cut. People looked at that from an, an interest rate differential standpoint and said that has to be dollar negative. And I think the whole market was just blind to what should have been obvious, which is the reason the Fed did that is because we have a global crisis of epic proportions, which is going to be super dollar positive. And it seems like that reality has finally hit the tape. So as far as I can see, it was just a knee jerk in the wrong Wrong direction, all the way down to 94 and change on the dollar index because people weren't seeing the big picture. I think they're finally starting to see the big picture, and I think the dollar rally has only just begun. All right, well, let's move on to crude oil because, I mean, we got down to the 20 handle. I didn't think we were going to break those lows at 26 uh, from uh, back in 2016, but here we are. What's your take on all of this? 
Well, Patrick, the fact that we took out the 216 low so quickly without even a bounce is a really bearish sign. It says that this market is even weaker than I thought it was. I had been tweeting all week that Arbob gasoline being below its 2016 low meant that crude was probably going to fall out lower. But even though I've been tweeting saying I think we're headed towards 20 bucks, I didn't think we were going to get there in one day. And sure enough, we did. Now, we're having a huge bounce off of that. There's been a little bit of posturing from Saudi Arabia that maybe they're going to rethink their strategy. And in general, we've got, you know, the president talking about how chloroquine is a a treatment. It's only a treatment. It's not a cure for anything. It seems like we're in the middle of a bounce in all risk assets. I don't think it's going to last, Patrick. I think that we're ultimately headed into the teens. And I think that $10 oil is entirely possible. The, The reason is I don't think the world has come to terms yet with the economic not not, not even slow down, the economic full stop event, which is about to be necessitated by the COVID-19 crisis. If we get down to $10 oil or even to the teens, it's going to be super contango. There's going to be a a massive contango in the market. As far as inventory this week, crude oil building 2 million barrels, Cushing, Oklahoma building 563,000 barrels, Gasoline drawing down 6.2 million barrels, distillates drawing down 2.9 million barrels. Tape action was down after that. Perhaps you could say that's a reaction to the, the crude build. But frankly, the tape action had been down all day. I don't think inventory made that much difference. It really was the market starting to come to terms with what's about to happen to the economy that was taking oil prices lower. And that happened before, during, and after the inventory release. U.S. production ticked back up to its previous all-time record high of 13.1 million barrels. All right, well, let's move on to gold because even a a week or two ago, uh, gold was a safe haven. But uh, when the real crash obviously begins, the correlation of all assets goes to one and and gold was not spared in all of this. Uh, We are currently trading at uh, 1472. What's, What's your take here on gold? Well, Patrick, as I've been saying for weeks, uh, and as you just said, correlations go to one in a sell-off. What you've got is people having to raise cash to deal with a crashing market, to deal with margin calls and so forth. And uh, they got to sell what they got. And I think that's going to continue. If I had to guess what the price is where it bottoms, I really don't have a guess. If I have to guess when the price bottoms, end of May. That would be my guess as to when both the stock market and the gold market bottom. If we look at 2008 as maybe being the pattern that we want to follow, the gold market bottomed quite a bit before the other asset markets did. So maybe it's earlier than that. But I think that as the real panic comes into the market, and I don't think it started yet, gold is probably going to get dragged down with it. I will be buying at 1350 if we get there, just because it's a key technical level and it's kind of foolish not to, but I won't be the slightest bit surprised if we go considerably below 1350. It really depends on how big the washout is in equity markets and how desperate people are to sell everything in order to raise cash. As far as what might be driving this right now, I do think it's margin calls and so forth. A couple of listeners wrote to me and said, hey, Eric, why don't you think, or why can't you see this is all Ray Dalio's fault? His fund has been long gold. His fund is blowing up. He's facing a lot of redemptions from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. This is all about Dalio. I certainly think that it's entirely possible that Bridgewater is part of this. Dalio has been long gold. They are under a lot of pressure. Maybe that's part of this, but I don't think he's the only one who is being forced to sell his gold, even though he probably doesn't want to, in order to deal with this situation. I know that Kevin Muir, has some views on some of the mechanics as to what exactly happened to the GDXJ ETF, which crashed much harder than gold itself did. Let's get Kevin in in post game in order to talk more about that. All right. Well, let's go to 10-year treasury yields. And it's interesting that bonds stopped rallying. I mean, in the last week, uh, while the rest of the stock market continued to to sell, bonds uh, joined the party. And it really seems like it's all asset classes other than the dollar are selling here. What's your take on all of this? I think this is scary, Patrick. You know, what I said a few weeks ago is, boy, we made 
such a quick move. It was. I, I said. I. I, I want to say that that bonds should be a buy given what's going on here. But they made such a quick move, and they were almost at zero. And you know, I said that's a little above my pay grade. I think this is still above my pay grade, frankly, and that's the reason I really look forward to interviewing Jim Bianco this week. What's on my mind, though, is really clear. Uh, We've been predicting for years, Patrick, that someday the day would come when we'd have a financial crisis where both bonds and stocks started selling off together at the same time. And we predicted that if that ever happened, if that inverse correlation between stocks and bonds ever broke down, it would force the unwind of the risk parity trade, which is the biggest single trade or biggest strategy in all of institutional finance. I'm wondering if that's actually started to happen. That one is pretty intense stuff. It is a bit over my pay grade. Jim Bianco is the man to ask, so let's get him in for the feature interview. This week's featured interview guest is Jim Bianco. So, Eric, why did we invite Jim back as this week's featured guest? Jim is the best guy for what we're looking at in the market right now. He's the only guy I can think of in finance who's been constantly two steps ahead of me with respect to this coronavirus COVID-19 situation. He saw it before I did. His charts were a big part of what woke me up to the whole situation. He's a fixed income guy. He's a macro guy, and he's a monetary policy guy. And boy, we've got a big dose of all those things. So we need to really get to the bottom of what happened with what I think was probably the biggest central bank intervention in recorded history last Sunday, what it means that the market still managed to trade down despite that action, what are the implications of that? I I just can't think of a better guy than Jim Bianco, and I'm really looking forward to this interview. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by TopTradersUnplugged.com. In recent weeks, we've been reminded of the fragility of world financial markets and how quickly sentiment can shift from risk on to risk off. Once again, the mantra of buy the dip and the determination of central banks will be put to the test. But as Chris Cole recently told us, the best approach to investing in the long run is very different from what's worked best in recent decades. To help Macro Voices listeners navigate an uncertain future, Niels Kastrup Larson, host of the Top Traders Unplugged podcast, has created a guide to the best investment books of all time. You can get a free copy at toptradersunplugged.com forward slash macro guide. And be sure to listen to my full length interview with Niels Kastrup Larson on trend following. The download link is in your research roundup email. Check out toptradersunplugged.com today. You'll be glad you did. Eric's interview with Jim Bianco is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager Eric Townsend. Joining me now is the one guy in finance who was all over the coronavirus story even before I was. That's Bianco Research founder Jim Bianco. I want to refer our listeners. We don't have a slide deck today because Jim has just been flat out with the various situations and markets. Jim's timeline on Twitter has some of the best graphs and charts showing the case growth of COVID-19 cases around the world. So I I encourage our listeners to check that out. Jim, I want to start with the, the big picture of, okay, monetary policy two weeks ago versus today is a very, very different story. I think some of our listeners have been overwhelmed. We know there was a massive intervention last weekend. We know there's an alphabet soup of new accommodative facilities, but almost nobody can keep track of all of them. Give us the the big picture summary. What has happened? What are central banks doing? And what's the summary of all the actions that they've taken? What central banks are doing, let's first of all go to the top and say, there is going to be a pre-virus world and a post-virus world. And that I think this virus, I'm with you, I think is the is going to be the defining thing of this generation. The marketplace, we can talk about that more later, but the marketplace right now is saying that the post-virus world is a completely different set of valuations. It's going to be deglobalization, de-risking, higher inflation, lower multiples, 
restrictions on trade, restrictions on travel, and the whole nine yards along with that. So we've got to change the way that we are doing business. And that means all prices have to come down. Now that all prices are coming down, central banks are seeing what's happening and they're trying to stop it. And I don't think they can. So they've been pushing out this set of rules and regulations and new programs. In fact, Christine Lagarde actually put out that the CCB will have no limit on her Twitter account at 1.30 in the morning in Paris. So they're like doing this stuff 24 hours a day right now. The Fed made their announcement of a money market liquidity fund facility at 11.30 at night last night. Now, what's happening, simply put, is as the selling began at the beginning of the month, late in February, the dealers that make markets were seeing everybody sell to them. They were buying from them. They bought to the point of their balance sheet. They couldn't buy anymore. Everybody's continuing to want to sell to the dealers, and the dealers are stuck, and they're having a very difficult time making markets. That is primarily showing up in the credit markets. The Federal Reserve and some of the other central banks, seeing the problems that the dealers are having, their balance sheets are full, everybody sold to them, they can't buy anymore, said, look, we will offer you repo at a trillion dollars a day. Now, that's really meant to just be an eye-popping signaling number, a trillion. The real number is actually infinity. They will offer as much as the dealers can take, but they put a nice big round eye-popping number on it as well. But if they wanted two trillion, they would give it to them. They wouldn't just stop it at one. But the problem with the dealers is they're not taking any of this repo infinity, if you want to call it that. The reason they're not taking it is the last 12 years in the post-crisis world, what we've been doing is creating these regulators have been putting out all these rules to prevent banks from leveraging up. That was the problem in 2008. So it's Basel III, it's the BIS, it's the European Banking Commission, it's the ECB, the Fed, the FDIC, the OCC, MOUSE, all of them together have put all these rules. So the Fed says, here's a trillion dollars, and the banks come back to them and say, I got all these rules, I'm not allowed to take any of the money. Yesterday, they took 10 billion of it. 10 billion of a trillion dollars is what they wound up taking in total. So the Fed then said, okay, your balance sheets are full and you can't expand them anymore through taking my trillion dollars of repo. So I'll drain your balance sheet. And that's QE. They're buy- they were through yesterday buying $40 billion of treasuries a day, plus some mortgage-backed securities on top of that. In other words, I'll reduce your inventory by $40 billion, I'll drain it, and then you can refill it. This morning, the Fed announced they're going to $75 billion starting today and $75 tomorrow, plus more MBS. And the ECB yesterday announced that they're going to do something similar. We're going to try and drain their balance sheets so that then they can refill them by making markets. The problem is, and I put this on my Twitter timeline just in the last 24 hours. If you look at the ETFs, the bond ETFs, they are trading at enormous discounts to the NAV, the net asset values. So the net asset values of these, and I'm talking about the five largest bond ETFs, not some random ETFs. I'm talking about AG, BND, Vanguard's Total Bond Fund, TLT, which is the 20-year treasury, LQD, which is the large corporate bond fund by iShares, and HYG as well, those type of funds. If you look at them collectively, they're trading at massive discounts, meaning here's the price of all the bonds in their portfolio. Here's where the ETF is trading, up to as much as a 4 to 6% discount, which is, which is incomprehensibly big for the bond market to see those kind of uh, discounts. And the reason that you're seeing those level of discounts is that is the market telling us that the real fair value in this post-virus world is far lower prices. And the dealers, even though they're being drained and being told to make markets, they're still stuffed with all these securities. They don't want to mark them down 
and take gigantic losses. So that's been the rub, and that's why the market has been so dysfunctional the last several days. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Now, I got an email this morning from a very well-connected CEO, a regular listener to Macro Voices, telling me that one of the issues that a lot of the banks are dealing with is market makers. They're, they're trying to send people home to work from home wherever they can. But by law, FINRA Series 24, I believe, market makers cannot make markets from home. That's, that's against the law, and apparently there's no waiver for that. And they think that one of the issues is, you know, there's people getting sick on trading desks and they can't send them home because the market makers are not allowed to work from home. Hopefully that will change. But I don't want to I don't want to focus on that specific issue. But it seems to me like it's indicative of a much bigger problem, which is I think you and I agree this crisis is just barely getting started in terms of what's coming to the West. What happens when we want to keep financial markets open I think it's important to keep financial markets open, but the key players are unable to work from home and you, it's not safe to, to have them in institutional trading floors anymore. Uh, what kind of systemic risks does that create that perhaps nobody has ever thought about? Yeah, uh, to your first point, that's just more of the same. We've put together these rules and in fairness to the regulators and everybody else, no one before January ever even contemplated what if there was a global pandemic that required a complete shutdown of the global economy? That was something out of science fiction and not something that you would have to consider when writing regulations. And the problem with all regulators is they're very slow after years of putting together rules, whether it is you can't make markets at home or you can't change your leverage rules for the banks, or even if it's the CDC telling the flu campaign in Seattle, you're not authorized to do COVID-19 tests, even though you single-handedly found the clusters in Seattle. You have to shut down because you're just not per our regulations. That's by the way all regulators think. And so it's going to be difficult for them to give away that power and say, okay, we're going to have to change all of this. In the meantime, that just means that markets will stay dysfunctional. They'll stay problematic markets will continue to try and sink lower and lower as we go from here. And the risk is an overshoot, an overshoot on the downside. The S&P is now down 30% in exactly a month. One month ago today, February 19th, was the all-time high. And now we're 30% down. The fastest from all-time high to 30% ever, not even close, 1929 was the old record. The fear is that metastasizes in the 40% or 50% in short order. And I don't think the financial system can handle that kind of a decline without there becoming a full-blown financial crisis. Look, we might be on the verge of one right now because of all of these losses. I think the only reason people don't think there is one, I think there's a lot of shock. I can't believe what's happening this isn't really happening. This market has to rebound, Eric, right? Please tell me it's going to rebound and it's going to be okay. But so that hasn't really sunk in to everybody just yet. Jim, I think the reason it hasn't sunk in is because I would argue that this entire 10-year greatest bull market in the history of, of the stock market that began in 2009 to me, the enabler of the entire thing is what used to be called the Greenspan put, uh, and more recently, the Fed put, the notion that, hey, things get really turned south. The Fed's got our back. They're going to bail the market out. Jim, I would argue that the Fed put expired at about 6.15 p.m. on Sunday evening. And what I mean by that is on Sunday, we had what I think was the biggest monetary policy intervention in recorded history, as I understand it. And everybody thought, OK, well, surely that's got to just send markets to the moon, to the upside. We ended up with futures limit down within 15 minutes of the Sunday futures open. Opposite expectation. Jim, to me, that was the moment where the market's confidence in central banks to be able to solve any problem failed, and it failed spectacularly and instantly. Would you agree with that? And if so, what are the consequences and implications of the Fed put having expired? I completely agree that it did expire at that point, or maybe even a little bit before, but that was definitely you know, the, 
the the whack to the face that it it doesn't work. And the reason the Fed put expired is because fundamentally we've got the wrong prices. Fundamentally, I think the market thinks that the proper price is still lower. And we're unwilling to accept that that is the case. Eric, maybe you've seen the same thing I do. All my friends that offer their opinion about the market to me, almost 95% of them are trying to pick a low. I can't find anybody at this point that still thinks that this market should still be sold. Everybody's still trying to pick a low right now. No one can conceive of this idea that, no, maybe it's a new era. It's a new post-virus era. And the post-virus era means that we are now in an era of lower prices. So the Fed put only works if your prices are somewhat near fair value. Then if the Fed comes in and your markets are functional and the Fed comes in and it does things aggressively, then it can help boost markets, the buy to dip mentality. But when you've got the wrong prices and you know that because your markets are dysfunctional, you could announce infinity. The Fed could just say infinity and beyond on everything. It's not going to change the reality that it's just the market thinks it's just in the wrong place and it could wind up going lower. Jim, I could not agree more. The one thing that I get from all of our listeners on Twitter, I get emails saying, my God, haven't you covered your shorts? Don't you see? This is the bottom. And my reaction, Jim, is, wait a minute. The market hasn't even begun to come to terms with what's about to happen. Everybody is finally starting to realize, okay, we've got a problem. They haven't come to realize that it's entirely possible that Hubei province could be a proxy for what's about to happen to the United States. And I, I made the case in my podcast yesterday for why I think that is entirely possible. So uh, I'm your one guy that you know who, who thinks that this is not a time to look for the bottom. It seems painfully clear to me, if you look at page eight of the Ferguson report that uh, I talked about in yesterday's podcast, it seems clear to me that when would the logical time be to be buying the bottom? End of May, 1st of June. I think that's when the market bottoms. But I, I want to come back to the Fed put having expired, because the question then is, what are the consequences and implications and what will happen next and what should be done next. Something that you've said publicly, Jim, is if the prices, that the low that we've seen doesn't hold, and it looks like it's not holding, you think that regulators are likely to shut down financial markets entirely. What I haven't heard from you publicly is, do you agree that that should happen? And if so, why? You're right. Let me be clear on this. When you start talking about shutting down the financial markets, you're down to two terrible options. Option one is let the markets free fall and let the damage that they may cause ensue. Option two is to halt the markets from having that free fall and the damage that they ensue. There is no option three. The market bottoms and it goes back up and the problem goes away. So you're stuck with two very bad options. I think regulators do not want to close markets. I think there's going to be a progression of how they'll attempt it. Progression one is they throw everything but the kitchen sink at them, which is what they're doing now. And by the way, Eric, as we're talking, the Bank of England just cut interest rates just three minutes ago. And option number two will be they'll ban short selling. They'll ban leveraged and inverse ETFs. They'll allow only liquidation trades only. They might ban stock index futures or maybe shorting of stock index futures. They might ban put buying or something like that. They did versions of that in 2008. And that's already taking place in Europe that they've started to ban short selling and the like. And then option three, if, it's, if that doesn't work and the market keeps going down, they have to look at some of their big banks, some of their big financial institutions and say, we can't let this keep going. They're going to fail. We're going to have 10 Lehman's on our hands. So shut it down. And you shut it down to the time that you wind up saying, now we've tested enough. Now we understand what the problem is. Now we know where the economy and market should be. Let's reopen them and price to that level. And then hopefully, even if that is a lower level, it's one time marked down. And then we could spend that time figuring out what we're going to do and then go forward from there. So I understand 
it's not an ideal situation. I fear that that's what they're going to do. I'm sympathetic to that argument because I'm also not thinking that the other thing is just just let it go to hell and we'll figure it out after that might actually be worse from there. Jim, I hear you loud and clear, but I see those two options a little bit differently. As you said, option number one, allow things to melt down. And my prediction would be that I don't think Americans have even begun to come to terms with what's happening. I think the people that are looking to buy a bottom are completely missing the story. And I think there's a lot of downside still to come. So I agree with you. That's very ugly. It potentially leads to systemic problems that are not just about people losing money in the market, but that really affect the national economy and and, and so forth. But I see option number two differently. As I see it, the, the choices are either you can continue to have transparent price discovery and watch prices go down, or you can close markets and values continue to go down exactly the same way. But it's exactly the same as an ostrich digging his head into the sand. What you're doing is you're not able to see what is still happening. And the other consequence of that is it means that you cut the people who might need to tap their savings the most off. The guy who needs, even though he, he's selling at a, at a very unattractive price, the guy who needs to sell some of those stocks in his portfolio because he's got to feed his kids and he lost his job because of the virus, that guy loses access to the markets. So I don't see the option number two as being any better than option number one. I want to give you a chance to tell me if I'm wrong and why I'm wrong. Well, see, the thing is, is you're not wrong. The problem is, is that, uh, again, I want to emphasize you're down to two terrible options here is what, what what we're down to. So there is no, you know, sunshine and flowers option that, that we, we haven't considered there. I just wonder which one would be worse in the long term. Now, again, I'll also mention that they'll do this in stages. Like I said, the next step will be, you know, ETFs and those span short selling and stuff like that. When we say shut down the market, I do think that they will probably put some kind of facility in place for people to maybe borrow against those holdings or money market funds would still be around to allow liquidation. But it is an option to be considered. I don't think that markets are quite bad enough now that that's there. But if we have another serious down leg, I think that that's on the table. So I am not going to defend the close the markets to my dying breath because I think we can agree, Eric, that we're, we're talking about two terrible options here, and there isn't a third one. And let's hope that we don't have to be having that discussion, but it is one that people should consider if things turn much lower as we continue to move forward, that that is probably going to be discussed. I understand the Philippines tried it last night. They closed their market. It reopened today, and it fell 24%. So there is that risk. Like you said, it just keeps getting repriced and it just reprices lower. And I just want to point out for the benefit of our listeners, all of the research shows that speculators reduce volatility in markets, not increase it. Short selling bans not only don't work, has been proven over and over again in research and analysis, but they can actually be counterproductive and exacerbate the problem. So I don't think that's a good thing, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Jim, I want to move on to another major subject, which is On Macro Voices for years now, we've talked about a specific scenario that I've been very, very concerned with, which is, you know, there's a rule in finance, which is the things that you have to worry the most about are the things that most professionals agree are not just unlikely, but impossible. And one of the things a lot of people think is impossible is a breakdown in the historic inverse correlation between stocks and bonds. And what I've said for years is someday we're going to have some kind of crisis where we've blown these bubbles in both the stock and bond market. They're both going to start selling off at the same time. And when that happens, watch out because it's going to force the unwind of the entire risk parity complex, which is the biggest institutional trade in existence. 
I am very, very intrigued by this backing up in yields. You are a fixed income guru. I fear that what we're starting to see is that breakdown of correlation where stocks and bonds are starting to sell off at the same time. Is that what's happening? And if so, what does it mean? Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening is that the correlation is breaking down. Let me go with what it means, and then I'll tell you why. It means that on the institutional side, risk parity trades and risk parity strategies are not working. A risk parity strategy, if you're not familiar with it, is you're trading the relationship between stocks and bonds, swapping back and forth between them. But when the relationship changes, you're just trading one losing position for another losing position. You just keep going back and forth. The biggest risk parity trader is Bridgewater. They reported last week that they lost 20%. And so you've started to see that started to play. On the retail side, the whole modus operandi of the wealth management business, which is booming in the United States, of 400,000 wealth managers that are driving the market is, everybody needs to be in the 60-40 portfolio because the 60-40 portfolio has that 40% fixed income leg that's supposed to protect you on the downside. Well, that isn't working either, is what's happening. That's been falling as well, too. So that's been creating a lot of pain on the retail side. Now, why is that happening? The answer, I think, is inflation. The reason, first of all, the stock bond relationship is not stable. It does change over time. It goes from being both of them moved together to both of them moving inversely or negatively correlated to both of them moving together. The current stock bond relationship we have started between 98 and 2000. And that is where stock and bond prices move opposite or yields and stocks move together. And the reason it started around 98 to 2000 is you'll remember that that was long-term capital, the Asian financial crisis, and the tech bubble. And coming out of all of those events, the word deflation became a front and center idea for 20 years. We worried at varying degrees for deflation. In a deflationary fear, in a deflationary mindset, when stock prices go down, we're afraid about deflation, you run the bonds. When stock prices go up, we are not as afraid of deflation, you get out of bonds. And so that relationship held. But if you go to an inflationary environment, and that was the 70s and the 80s, when you fear that inflation is returning, mainly the 70s, bond prices, bond prices and stock prices both go down. That Or yields go up and stocks go down, same thing. And that is bad for them. And when, you feel, when you're relieved that there is no inflation, the, the 80s, they both go up together. I think what's happening is that the market is saying that 20-year deflationary era is coming to an end, and the era we're about to transition into is going to be an era of inflation, and that you're now going to see stock and bond prices go up and down together. And that is going to take a while for, first of all, it isn't a light switch. Well, this is the old relationship. This is the new relationship. When we switched from 98 to 2000, it was fully two to three years where it seemed like it broke down, it reconnected, it broke down, it reconnected, it broke down, and then it stayed broke down. This one will be the same way. The stock bond relationship is changing. That stock and bond prices will move together, not opposite each other, so that when you see a hint of inflation or you see a hint of problems, they both fall. When you see things getting better, they both rise. And that is going to change the whole way that the whole way that 36 million people have their money with wealth managers, and it's in some version of a 60-40 portfolio. 36 million accounts need to be changed. The whole way that Wall Street hedges itself and views the markets in a risk parity framework, that's got to change. It doesn't have to change today. That relationship will, will vacillate over time. But I think that it is about that we finally are transitioning to an inflationary period, something we haven't seen in at least 20 years. We're not there now. That's a post-virus thing. And we're about to head there as uh, we get through this initial crisis with the virus. Jim, I want to make sure that we put this in perspective because we had a major blow up in markets at the beginning of 2018. And what happened was the whole volatility complex basically blew up in one day. And the reason that happened was a very, very small little uh, click of, of guys figured out how to monetize 
that can tango yield in the term structure of VIX futures. And it was uh, uh, picking up nickels in front of a steamroller trade. You know, it, it produced just terrific returns until the day it blew up. And they all got their fingers burned. That was a tiny, 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 little, small, minuscule percentage of the people in financial markets that were even involved in that trade. And their activities caused an event that sent ripples through the entire financial system. What we're talking about here is not that. We're talking about everybody who's got a 60-40 portfolio. That's basically 99% of retail investors. Plus, most of institutional finance, most of the big hedge funds like Bridgewater and so forth, what they're all about is kind of a, a turbocharged version of that 60-40 portfolio. They've got equities, and then they use leverage to lever up the bonds. The only way, Jim, that they can justify having that leverage, because normally leverage involves an extreme amount of risk that would not be appropriate for an institutional portfolio. The way they justify that leverage is that that risk of leverage is hedged by the equity portfolio and the inverse correlation. What it means, and this is the part I really want you to tell me if I've got it wrong, because you're much closer to these institutional guys than I am. What I understand is the way that they do business, if the correlation breaks down, they're forced to unwind their trades. It's not a question of anybody panicking. It's a question of, oh, the, the numbers say this, I'm now forced to do that. And that, in this case, is sell all the bonds and all the stocks. Is it really as simple as that, or am I reading too much Zero Hedge? It is. The, the, roughly, the framework is right. And first of all, the 2018 period you referred to, I love the word, is Falmageddon. And that was what we, what we referred to it as. But let me put it to you more basic. They're allowing themselves to leverage and be aggressive because there is a belief that there's this gigantic asset class, the treasury market, that I could run to for a hedge. I could be way out there on the on the edge, you know, risking it all because in a heartbeat, I can go and protect myself in the treasury market because it moves in the opposite direction all the time. But if on the other side, you start to realize I'm way out there on the edge. And if something goes wrong, there's no net now. There's no, oh, just go just go engage in buying some some derivatives based on treasuries or swaps or something like that. And therefore, if I lose on this primary trade, I will offset it on this on this hedge. There is no hedge. There is no thing you can do to protect yourself. There is one thing you can do to protect yourself. Sell out of your position is liquidate your position. So yes, that's exactly what's happening is that they're starting to realize I don't have a way to protect myself anymore. Or I do. It's called liquidate and go to cash. And I think that that's part of what's also driving the immediacy of these trades right now, that they, they, they can't do it. Like I said, you know, I saw this in the fourth quarter of 18. In the fourth quarter of 18, when the stock market, you recall, the Fed was talking about hiking rates. And then the market sold off 20 percent and everybody was screaming to Powell you had the wrong strategy. The bond market, the high yield market was looking a little bit wobbly, but nobody sold anything in the high yield market because they said, hey, we've got HYG, I could short that. We've got credit default swaps. I could protect myself on that. I could be put options on HYG. And so I'm not going to sell my big, massive portfolio of illiquid securities. I'm just going to write it out with a hedge. And then when I think it's all done with, I'll get rid of the hedge because the hedge is easier, more liquid to put on and take off. You don't have that now. You don't have that now in dysfunctional markets. You only have liquidation. And that's where I think that 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 mentality is there in some places. The hope is that those hedges will return and that that risk can come back. But if these relationships have changed, that's those hedging opportunities are not going to come back. Okay, Jim, I want to put this in perspective because on one hand, what we're saying is with this change in correlation, it forces people to liquidation. They don't really have another choice. Meanwhile, not only can they not hedge anymore, but we also agree that the Fed put has expired. Now, you say the only option is liquidation. I just want to be really clear. Liquidation is not a solo act. It takes two to tango. Liquidation means selling something for which somebody has to buy. 
if we've got all of institutional finance and all of the panicking retail complex selling both stocks and bonds at the same time, who are the buyers in that scenario? Well, there isn't. And that's why, as we talked about in the beginning, the dealers are full, the markets are dysfunctional, and we've seen the biggest collapse ever recorded off of an all-time high in markets. This is, um, you know, and like I said, it especially shows up in markets that are not traded on regulated exchanges, like in the credit markets and stuff. So this is why these markets are so stressed, and this is why these markets are trading at such difficult levels right now, and why I think that it's still a little early to call for a low in the markets. You're just, you know, just trying to catch the proverbial falling knife. Maybe you get lucky, but it's never a good strategy to do that. I really want to pick up on that point, Jim, because I couldn't agree more. And something that I keep hearing, the the biggest bit of feedback I'm getting both on Twitter and emails from listeners is, okay, surely, you know, this has gone all the way down 30%. And uh, it's got to be time to buy the bottom. What should I buy here? That, that's the question I get. The other thing that I hear a lot is, yeah, it's interesting the way this one went, because we've gone all the way down now. But what was curious about it is it happened much faster than previous crises. In previous crises at this point, time-wise, we'd only be one-third of the way through the crisis. And I, I think what people are missing is, what if we're only one-third of the way down? What if this is only the first third of the price movement? And the reason I say that, Jim, is I really don't think in the United States of America that hardly anybody has come to terms with what's about to happen. If you look at Ferguson's report, which we talked about in detail on yesterday's podcast, what it shows is we're at a point now where we haven't even gotten to beginning to overwhelm healthcare systems. We haven't gotten to the point where the reflexive feedback loops start to kick in. We haven't gotten to the point, and if, when people ask me, well, what's if you don't think this is it, what's the number? And I tell them, there's no number. I don't know the number. But when I think it's logical to expect markets to maybe start to bottom would be the end of May, beginning of June, because that's the peak point on page eight of the Ferguson report. That's when we're going to have the, the most blood in the streets in terms of the virus effects peaking. And what we've seen so far is this market is not anticipating ahead of time what's going to happen. The market only reacts to these virus events after they've occurred. You and I were talking about this in the end of January. You know, market kept going up. It wasn't until the cases started happening outside of China, even though all the smart people knew that was going to happen. Markets didn't move until the evidence was there. And so by that logic, I don't see why you would expect markets to bottom until the end of May. Uh, what's wrong with that logic? Because I, I, I want to make sure that I don't say that and, and I have our listeners not hear the other side of the story. There's, there's nothing wrong with that logic. For those that want to buy a bottom, I've gone to, okay, the market's fallen a lot. And that's your definition that we need to make a bottom. What's the consequence of this? What happens when the virus goes away? And I think most of these people, their answer is we go back to work and everything returns, quote, to normal. Uh, well, what if it doesn't? Then you have to start to contemplate that maybe that's what these markets are trying to tell you, is that coming out of this is not going to be the same as it was going into it. Even if we find a vaccine, I don't think it's going to be the same. I think things are going to change in a lot of different ways as well, too. Let me turn to when I say it's going to change, before we even find a vaccine, the Neil Ferguson report, by the way, I mentioned this to you offline, I mentioned this to every of the listeners, he announced yesterday he tested positive for COVID-19 as well, too. He talked about all of the suppression techniques that we could use to flatten the curve and not overwhelm the healthcare system. But what was the thing that supposedly got Trump in the White House really eye-opened was this returns in the fall. This returns next year. So that it isn't, we flatten the curve, we try to lessen the burden on the healthcare system, and then it burns out and goes away forever. It only goes away when one of two things happens, according to the report. Herd immunity, which is 70 or 80% of the population of the planet gets this and builds up an immunity to it, or vaccine. So, 
we're all preparing to work at home. We're all preparing to have our kids be homeschooled online. We're going to do this again in the fall. We're going to do this again in the spring of 21 until either herd immunity or a vaccine comes. I bring that up hoping that is not the case. But the reality is, why do you think markets are doing what they're doing? This is what they're afraid of. So why are you in such a hurry to pick a bottom? You would be only if you think this is going to be temporary, it will go away, and then it'll be right back to January 2020 as if it never happened. I cannot imagine that that would be the case. I can see in the post-virus world that we're going to do this not only over and over till this is over, but the next one. Every two to three years, there's some kind of pandemic that comes out of Africa or Asia, SARS, Ebola, MERS, H1N1, bird flu. We didn't take any of those seriously. Well, when we're past this one, 2022, 2023, and the next one comes because there's always another one, we're going to shut everything down all over again. And then we're going to say, well, nothing came of it. Nobody got sick. And we're going to say, aha, it's because we shut everything down. Or maybe it wasn't that serious. Ah, Not after 2020. We're not going to pretend that these things aren't serious anymore. So my point is, we're not going to go back to where we were before. So that's why I think that we need to understand what these markets are trying to tell us. And I don't disagree with them. I don't think that these markets are wrong in their assessment of where we're going next. Jim, so far we've been discussing this in terms of the virus, as if it's all about the virus. I'd like to introduce another possibility, which is I would make the argument that for the last 10 years, we've had what a lot of people have criticized as a completely unsustainable system, one in which the the previous free trade, free market capitalism was kind of replaced by central banks and central bank liquidity fueling a massive bubble in both stocks and bonds at the same time. And because that correlation was working, it allowed people to just keep laying leverage on, leverage on more and more. It, you know, that just the bubble kept getting bigger. What if it turned out that although the virus is a really, really big deal, I think we agree on that. What if the, the main effect of the virus on financial markets was not its direct effect, but rather that it's serving as the pin that pops a bubble that systematically needed to be popped or was going to pop someday anyway. Maybe this was just the catalyst that brought about a collapse of what's been built for the last 10 years, I would argue, on kind of false pretense. I I think that's exactly what it was, was it was the pin. And I'll remind everybody, let's look at some previous examples. Well, you know, they'll say, do you remember SARS? I don't. Yes. Do you know what day? SARS was announced as a global pandemic two days after the Iraq war began. We were preoccupied with other things. And that was April of 2003. The markets had already, we were just completing a recession. They were just coming off of 40% decline. There was a risk attitude in markets best summarized by the Federal Reserve. In March of 2003, the Federal Reserve used to offer this assessment of the economy, and they said the assessment of the economy was so uncertain that they couldn't offer it. Well, if you're going to have a a pandemic in that environment, when everything is already depressed and you have fear, you're not going to get much more of a depression in markets. 1918 was the same thing. Markets were depressed and feared because we had just fought a terrible war. That's why the Spanish flu did not wind up having, you know, some kind of a negative effect on markets. This one came at the height of a raging bull market. This one came at the height of a market that supposedly had the perfect hedge. Go ahead, risk the farm on everything. And you could run into liquid treasuries in three seconds to protect yourself if it doesn't work. And this was the one where everybody's got to buy stocks. The famous Trump tweet of January of this year. Stock market's up 90%. Why aren't you in your 401k? It's not too late. And I'll only say don't totally blame Trump on that. He was reflecting a mentality that a lot of people had. It was when this one came, not what it was. SARS might have done this. 
if it came in January of 2020. The Spanish flu might have done this if it came in 2020, but they came when markets were already depressed and near recessionary levels to begin with. This one came in the 11th year of an expansion when the president of the United States is running on re-election that you need to re-elect me because the stock market's up. That was the belief that we had on it. So yeah, this was the big pin. You never know what the pin is, but you know the balloon is ready for a pin, and this just happened to be it. Jim, before we close, I want to first salute you because you're the only guy I know of in finance who has been consistently two steps ahead of me on this whole coronavirus issue since day one. You were on top of this, and your graphs and charts and your projections of the exponential growth curves have been incredibly insightful. So as the guy who kind of saw this before everybody else, my final question to you is this. What do you see that maybe nobody else is seeing yet? What are your new theories that maybe aren't fully vetted yet, but you're thinking about that maybe no one has seen that might be of interest to our listeners? Okay, I've got one about China. And uh, I'm going to throw out a big number and let me define it. China says that there are 81,000 cases. I think they're off by orders of magnitude, and I think that they're off by a thousand X. Now, let me explain that. I think there's 81 million cases in China. Let me rephrase that. That's 6% of the population, meaning 94% of the population did not get this. That sounds entirely reasonable that 6% of the population of China got this. Not 81,000, but 81 million. Remember, it's a country of 1.4 billion people. They say that they had 3,400 deaths. I think that that's off by 1,000x. I think it's more like, you know, millions. Now, the reason I say that is, well, wait a minute. A death is a binary thing. You're either dead or you're not dead. Keep in mind that in the Chinese healthcare system, they do things a little differently. And there was an exact example of this came around in February. An 85-year-old man with a heart condition contracts SARS. He's in his house under quarantine, and he's feeling deathly ill. He leaves his house from quarantine to walk to the nearby clinic, has a heart attack and dies one block from the clinic, and they, there was a famous picture of him laying on the street or on the sidewalk. The healthcare system in China will list him as cause of death, heart attack. It's accurate because he died of a heart attack, but they don't list a secondary cause like we do in the West. So I think they're grossly underestimating the number of people that have died from this. Now, why is that important? Because I do think that they've finished a wave and that they've probably flattened out, but at a much, much higher level. They are trying to restart their economy. And I'm going to give you one statistic. TomTom is the GPS tracking system that is in a lot of cars. TomTom has real-time tracking of congestion indexes for major cities around the world. You could go to their website and find out to this minute what is the congestion patterns in any city. If you look at Milan and you look at Rome, in Rome and Milan, they are showing congestion patterns are down 20-ish percent, maybe 25 percent thereabouts, depending on what time you measure it. In China, where the government is still trying to announce, we are restarting, we are getting back to business, they're still down 40 to 50%. I think the biggest story that we're missing about, oh, it's, it's all over with in China. We don't understand the amount of emotional and psychological damage that this did to the Chinese economy. You don't shut down the Chinese economy for 81,000 people that cost 3,400 deaths in a country of 1.4 billion. You do it because it's far, far worse. And that emotional damage is far, far worse in China. And you also see it in social media. And you also pick it up that the amount of, of social unrest, the amount of complaining to the government, the amount of complaining online is the highest that they've ever seen, that people are very angry that this happened to them. This is leaving a mark in China. And that's what I think we need to understand. It's going to leave a mark in Italy. It's going to leave a mark in Iran. It's going to leave a mark in Europe. And it's going to leave a mark in the United States. We don't know what that mark is going to be, but we can see 
that China is really struggling to get back to normal, even if their caseloads are as low as they say. But it is much more damaging than anybody thinks. They just did not sit at home and watch endless hours of streaming videos, and then they're going to go back to work like nothing changed. Jim, before we let you go today, please tell our listeners what you do at Bianco Research. Uh, You've got a day job that's not solving the world's problems and being the first guy to see the coronavirus situation. What's your normal day job, and how can our institutional investors find out more about what you offer? Bianco Research is an investment service that is primarily designed for institutional investors. It really revolves around macro and the fixed income markets. I am affiliated with an institutional brokerage firm called Arbor Research and Trading, has a bunch of bond brokers that do trades, or you can purchase subscriptions to our research as well, too. In these unusual times, I've really turned up the volume on social media. My LinkedIn account at James Bianco or at Bianco Research, you'll find a lot of what we're doing now because markets are so fast moving. And, you know, that when you put out a daily letter, it's like, wow, look at this. I can't wait 20 more hours to let the world know about this. So I've been doing a lot more of that on social media and probably will until things calm down. I won't go to zero when it comes down, but I'll do a little bit less of it there. And then there's our website, BiancoResearch.com, and you can request a free trial on our website and you can get right in and see some of the stuff that we do. Well, Jim, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. We look forward to getting you back in the future. And again, listeners, at Bianco Research is an absolute must-follow on Twitter to stay abreast of Jim's latest graphs and charts regarding the coronavirus crisis. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message. This episode of Macro Voices was sponsored by my own vacation rental on the coast of Maine. It's a five-acre oceanfront family compound with two separate residences, two kitchens, and eight king and queen bedrooms. In addition to that, there's a whole bunch of pull-out sofas and bunk beds and stuff, so we can actually sleep upwards of 30 people in a pinch, including all of the bunk beds. And it's super-duper popular. We were completely, totally sold out for this entire season. But my expectation is that the entire rental season is probably going to be a write-off. We have people planning to fly in from California and Seattle, and obviously that's now in serious question. I think we are or should be headed toward a national travel ban. You could not imagine a better safe haven to ride out the COVID-19 crisis than this property. It's extremely rural. You could not ask for better social distancing has sunsets over the ocean, has a great big rec room with a pool table and a home theater and super fast 100 megabit cable internet to keep you connected to both Netflix and the financial markets and so forth. At this point, I think that the vacation rental season is going to be a write-off. So I'd like to find a tenant. Uh, Hopefully I can help somebody too. The ideal tenant would be, you know, a, a family in New York City who wants to get the hell out of the city to ride this crisis out in the countryside. Now, to be clear, the property is currently booked in July and August. I would need to renegotiate with my current reservations if I was going to rent it to someone else. But I've got a feeling that would be easy to do. So if you or anyone you know is looking to find a safe haven to spend the next few months out of New York City or whatever city you live in, I would suggest that unless you do it really soon, that you be close enough to drive to Midcoast, Maine. It's right on the on the ocean front. It's got west facing views, so you see the sunset over the ocean. It's a fantastic place to be. Uh, normally, this is early season, but it's available starting right now. And I've got a feeling it's available all the way through the end of August. Now, it's totally booked, but I think it's going to get unbooked as this crisis unwinds. If anybody's interested in that, please contact me via info at macrovoices.com. Send me an email and I'll let you know more about it. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. 
We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, what a, a great interview with Jim Bianco. And But uh, joining us now in the post game is Kevin Muir, the macro tourist. And uh, we really wanted to look at some of the more technical and quantitative perspectives of, of what's going on in the markets. And I couldn't think of someone that understands this more than you, Kev. So welcome to the show. Great to be with you guys. So our listeners, you can download the chart book that we're going to be referencing in, in the Research Roundup email, or you can click the download button on the website. Now, first thing I wanted to go to on chart two is a chart that I added, which is going back to Chris Cole's volatility and the alchemy of risk that they wrote at Artemis all the way back in 2017. And uh, when we had him on the show in 2018, right before the vol event, he was talking about that explicit short vol as well as the implicit short vol. And the implicit short vol was all the risk parity, vol control, uh, risk premium harvesting funds. And of course, he talked about also the impact of the uh, share buybacks and how this is all an implicit short gamma trade. And uh, what well, took two years, you know, after the big vol event, we had Chris on and he said, well, that was just the uh, appetizer and the, uh, the, the main course is coming in terms of this, uh, this implicit short gamma risk. And it happened here. The last month it was that. And so uh, what we have on page three and four, some of just what happened in this risk parity segment of the market. Why don't you talk us through what you saw happen here and, and how did this all unravel? Well, the main thing to realize about risk parity is that they adjust their exposure to different asset classes based upon the volatility of the market. So when the market was uh, going up nice and steady, they were increasing exposure and it was kind of the best of both worlds. Bonds were rallying, stocks were rallying, they kept increasing their exposure. Then the virus hits and all of a sudden we get a kind of a, a shock to the system. And that shock causes the kind of volatility to increase. And that in itself causes them to cut back on their exposures, which then causes more volatility, which then becomes a feedback loop until ultimately you have a, a kind of this chart where from Nomura that shows the gross risk parity estimated exposure, meaning based upon the volatility of the market, how much exposure should they have? And you can see that going into the uh, before the crisis, it was supposed to be 500 percent or 550 and we're now down to 250. So this volatility shock has forced managers to delever by, you know, approximately 50%. And Kev, like the other thing to add there is that they have to also deal with assets under management shrinking. Like there was, I think, a rumor that there was uh, like sovereign wealth funds and other things uh, drawing huge amounts of capital out of these risk parity funds. That, that just even adds to that selling, right? That's right. There's the, one, the biggest of the risk parity funds. They're supposedly uh, one of their biggest clients is the Saudi Wealth Fund. And when we had the shock to the system with the kind of the change in their policy with the, the undercutting of the pricing of the Russians, we saw them withdraw a lot of money and that caused a lot of redemptions at that fund. And if you go look here at this next chart, we have the S&P Risk Parity 15 Vol Index. Basically, this is a portfolio if you manage it to 15% Vol. What's interesting about this, Patrick, is that if you look at it in 2018, in that sell-off, it handled it pretty well. It was basically unchanged uh, or down maybe a little bit. But you can see that in 2019, it was rocketing higher, but has given up all the gains and then some. So now you're starting at a situation where you've given up the past two years and you're underwater. Kev, now, obviously, risk parity blew. And this is, this is crazy because it affected all asset classes. I mean, you're talking currency, bonds, gold, everything got impacted by it. But what was interesting is, is that how this has impacted the ETFs. And so on uh, page five, I'm asking the question, are ETFs broken? And uh, while this happened in a whole array of ETFs, you wrote about in your recent uh, macro tourist log piece there about the GDXJ. And so what I started with here on page six was just a, a, a chart showing this. And what was crazy is a three-time leveraged uh, NGUT there all just imploded. It went also some from 40 like to $5 or something crazy like that. But here the GDXJ went from $46 down to under $20 at one point, just a, an incredible drop. But the, those two days where it basically dropped from $34 down to 20, something broke. And you showed uh, in your blog uh, some really interesting charts that explain it. So why don't you take us through what you saw happening in the GDXJ? 
Right. This was one of the first ETFs that I saw that was under big pressure that actually caused dislocations and arbitrages that usually um, kind of get fixed up and uh, brought into line right away were not being brought into line. So I noticed this on the 11th of March. You saw some selling later in the day. And for the first time, the GDXJ traded at a slight discount to the NAV, the net asset value. Then the next day on the 12th, you saw it trade okay all day. But then later in the day, there was a big sell order. And when someone sells late in the day at just any price, that really reeks of just get it off the sheets. Like just get this position off or the margin clerk or your prime broker blowing the position out. In this case, it's probably a prime broker because this was a size trade they were doing. And what you saw there was that it treated at a discount to NAV in the last hour, but then towards the end of the day, it was kind of brought back into line by the arbitrageurs. Then on Friday, it just, the stuff hit the fan, man. It just went and it started trading below nav it stayed below nav all day and culminated with a monster sell-off into the close where it went to an almost 20 percent discount to nav now in a, in a perfectly efficient market this shouldn't happen you could go buy that gdxj short all the stocks in the index and earn 20 percent instantaneously no risk so I, you know, I worked on an institutional equity desk uh, that did derivatives like this. We would have never let this get there. And this is why I wanted to highlight this. The market is broken. And there's too many traders sitting at home in their pajamas or, you know, the risk managers in another room, you know, in Connecticut instead of in the New York office. And what's happened is the system is broken. It's just not able to, to operate efficiently. So where, whereas usually you'd have a trade like this, that get arbitrage, there's now no one to take the other side. And, you know, I've been pushing and I thought that they should have actually closed the exchange. I get labeled kind of uh, a crybaby and that I should let it go down. I didn't think you should close the exchange because the prices were going down. I thought you should close the exchange because things were no longer functioning because just the physical proximity of people being around each other and running these machines it was necessary and it was no longer working so this gdxj was sold by this big institution and ended up causing way more pain than it should have because the fact is there was no one to take the other side of the trade kevin let's move on to page eight this chart looks a little different than what we're used to what's going on here on this bloomberg screen grab that we're looking at well, it's one thing when GDXJ, which is an index of gold uh, miners, junior miners, trades at a discount. It's another thing when the Vanguard Total Bond Market ETF trades at a wicked discount. And that's what we're looking at here. Whereas last week it was kind of relegated to, you know, these obscure ETFs. This week it blew out and it went into the kind of bigger ones. This BND is almost a $50 billion market cap ETF. And it was trading at a 6% discount to NAV this week. This is a signal that the market is extremely broken. Now, some people will say that this is a problem with the passive and this was inevitable. I argue it has more to do with the fact that there's no arbitrageurs and that the systems aren't able to operate correctly in this environment. Now, on page nine, the next chart, uh, we're looking at Big PX, it says on the Bloomberg. I'm assuming that's big picture trading has uh, <laughs> made it to, to Bloomberg. No, that's the BlackRock 6040 portfolio mix. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight was the fact that although this did start off as a risk parity slash other vault targeting fund sell off, it is kind of morphed into a mom and pop sell off now. And we're seeing all portfolios and even the kind of classic 60 40 portfolio getting absolutely crushed. And so this index, you know, has gone from 14 down to 11, 15. I've been kind of inundated with calls from friends, family members worried about the market. It, it has gone from being something that was just kind of an esoteric sell off to now full fledged panic across the board. And when you look at uh, page 10, though, it, that's a, a Numera chart there. Again, it's showing that this drop in that 60-40 portfolio, at least on their chart, it was a 15% drawdown in 18 days. That was an eight-sigma move. 
is extraordinary. In the chart here of 20 years of history, there was no point, even during 2008, that we had a move of this magnitude in a 6040 portfolio. Okay, now I want to get to what I really want to talk to both of you guys about. And I'm going to do this a little differently. I'll explain why I'm so interested in your view after I get it. But I want to start with what do you guys think? Are you feeling like we're we're at a bottom here where it's time to start buying? Well, I, I wrote a piece on, uh, I guess, Tuesday saying that I was sticking my finger in and uh, starting to nibble on the long side. And I was kind of laughing, Eric, because when I did that, you retweeted something uh, saying that uh, – I might be a little early and don't see the big picture. And uh, have you ever seen that, you know, when a lion is eating a gazelle and uh, after they're done, there's all those hyenas that are waiting to come and eat the rest of the gazelle. And once the lion walks away, they jump on that carcass. That's what I felt like. (laughs) I felt like I was just getting lambasted for the idea of buying stocks here. And uh, I must say that I understand the pessimism But I think that that's fully baked into the market and that uh, you got to start with the blue tickets and put away the pinks now, I think. And Patrick, what's your take? Well, our big picture trading members covered their shorts on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and uh, we were poking in going long as of yesterday. Now, to me, this is uh, purely uh, a technical reactionary move, and no way am I getting bigger picture bullish just yet. To me, the market is incredibly oversold, and and a number of quants that are out there are pointing out the huge roll-off of the March 20th options. There's a something close to like $500 billion of uh, short put gamma uh, or delta, sorry, that is basically has an expiration of March 20th. And it has to be either rolled and it's going to either be rolled at an 80 vol, which I seriously doubt, or it's going to start to be closed. That's going to in itself put a little bit of buying pressure on the short term. So I think these incredibly oversold conditions can have a, a reflexive rally, but uh, I'm not yet convinced that that's somehow a meaningful long term bottom. Okay. The reason I wanted to ask both of you guys that question is I really think there's a huge value to teamwork among people who have different talents. And I really want to give Kevin credit. The last time he was on the show, we disagreed. Kevin said he thought, you know, it's time to start buying here. And I was, I said, you're crazy. You don't even see the big picture. You don't know what's going on. Kevin's call proved right. And it's funny because Kevin's been crediting me for being right on Twitter. What happened is Kevin, the Kevin said long the stock market here. Stocks went up. And about a week later, Kevin said, I think this feels like the top. And he went short and he got the top of the market perfectly. So for that being one step ahead of the market, I, I respect both of you guys as having more skill than I do. And I really take to heart what you say, because if you both feel like it's time for the market to go up, I bet you're going to be right. Now that we've covered that, You and everybody else are totally, completely missing what's really about to happen here, which is this COVID-19 crisis is going to be way bigger than the great financial crisis. It is uh, something that the world hasn't even come to terms with the scope of. What's about to happen in the United States is going to be scary. As far as where the bottom comes in the S&P, I have no idea on the number, but I think the date is around June 1st. And I don't think that the whole country has even begun to come to terms with what's about to happen. So it says to me, if you guys think that it's time for market to go up, I bet you're going to be right in the short term. I don't know how far up, but I think it's an opportunity to sell it when we get to whatever that top is, because I think there's a lot of downside still to come. Well, Eric, you might be right. Listen, I've made the mistake of underestimating how large this will be. And you, I, I give you all the credit in the world. You were out there in front of it telling everybody that it was going to be bigger. And the fact that you're still telling people that, you know, leads me to worry a little bit. Having said that, for the longest time, your view was not accepted. And it was something that only kind of the elite few in the Macro Voices listeners were getting the inside information. But it was not accepted in the regular community. At this point now, you know, the other day I watched on CNBC a hedge fund manager get on there and I thought he was going to, you know, break down emotionally because he was so upset. And then he was talking about how stocks were going to go to zero. I see that the VIX closed above 70 every day for a week. 
We have credit spreads blowing out. We have off the run govies, you know, trading at spreads not seen since the long term capital. We have these examples of these ETFs trading at wicked discounts. It just feels to me like, you know, they say buy when there's blood in the streets, especially if that blood's your own. I was a little early, so I am bleeding all over the street. But I, I do think that we're hit that point of maximum pessimism. And I do notice that, you know, Patrick is really a smart guy. And uh, there's other smart guys that are also picking away on the long side or at the very least closing their shorts. I noticed that Raul Powell from uh, Real Vision, he closed all of his shorts in HYG, equities and oil and everything. Gunlack actually tweeted the other day that the first time in years he's not net short any U.S. stocks. This was a massive margin call that caused prices to get to points that were really kind of almost ridiculous. And I think that you very well might be right from a health perspective. I just wonder if you're going to be right from a stock market perspective. And one of the things is I would be more inclined to kind of use your view if I saw the politicians not doing anything. I always say that the once the politicians start panicking, the market can stop panicking. And that's really what I've been waiting for is the politicians to panic. And I see that the amount that they're throwing at this just gets larger and larger and larger. You see the Fed coming out and cutting and doing QE. When that's not enough, they do um, a corporate paper buyback. When that's not enough, they go do their swap lines. They are doing whatever it takes. The same with the ECB, with all of these things. And then on the fiscal side, I really think we've been talking about this, Eric, you and I, for a long time, that eventually MMT or MMT-like policies are coming Well, I feel like they're here. So although I I completely defer to you on the health side of it, and I don't deny one bit that it's going to get a lot worse, I just wonder if the amount of liquidity and stimulus that's thrown at this makes it diverge from fundamentals. Don't forget it was only kind of, you know, six months ago that everyone was saying it makes no sense that stocks are trading so firm given the kind of the underlying strength of the economy. And I think that we could once again see a situation where we're saying it makes no sense that stocks are trading so firm, given the, the carnage that is happening in the economy. And that's, uh, that's, that's my main point, is everyone thinks that this is the, this is the period where fundamentals of stocks and, uh, you know, and the economy converge. And I'm saying that I'm not so sure you're correct. And at the very least, I would be weary of being short looking at for it to go significantly down with them kind of printing and spending so much money. Well, I take that very seriously and I value your opinion. And it definitely makes me tempted to cover my shorts and wait for better location to reenter at a higher number. I don't think we've seen anything close to the bottom, but if you guys both think, and you know, you mentioned some really big names, Jeff Gundlich, uh, these guys are all covering their shorts. It doesn't matter whether they're right long-term. If you've got those kinds of people with the kind of influence they have on markets all covering at the same time, that makes the market go higher. So it sounds to me like maybe we do have a tactical rally that it's, it's time to trade. Uh, I'm still convinced that this, it's not a question of over or, or, or not over. It hasn't even started yet in a meaningful way. People haven't even begun to get their heads around what's about to happen. So I don't think it's a question of over or not over. It's a question of has it started? And the answer is no. And Eric, it is incredibly rare if uh, if an, a bear market of this magnitude was just to be over in a month. Even if there is a tactical rally, often bear markets can last six months or a year or even longer as everything starts to break and it takes a while for everything to fully wash out. And so very likely that there'll be another leg down at some point. So it's not that you want to be outright bullish and just load a, load you know your portfolio up like it's a new bull market. It's just... Just, uh, it's pretty oversold and so extreme on the end that a reflexive rally would be incredibly natural here. I couldn't agree more. Eric, you've been very kind to me and saying some really nice things, but I'm going to return the favor because I think you made the call of my lifetime when we were chatting off air after I was on the line with you the last time. And you said to me that you thought this was the greatest mispricing of risk that you had ever seen in your lifetime on the markets. And kudos to you because you were spot on correct. 
the market completely missed it, and you were right. And you know, it it, it does make me worry uh, that that you're once again saying the same thing. And so maybe I'll be right for a week again, and then we'll be talking, and we'll be doing the, this again from a thousand S and P points lower. We'll see what happens, but I don't think that the pandemic reaches a peak level of pain until June first. And uh, I think that what's coming in terms of the amount of economic shutdown that will be required to contain the virus is bigger than anybody's reacting to it. It's it's fascinating to hear you guys talk because when you said a few minutes ago, you said it's when you see the politicians panicking that the market doesn't have to anymore. I agree with the logic of that. The thing is, what I see here is politicians not yet even beginning to take this situation seriously. You guys see it as them panicking. So needless to say, we we think there's a different perspective on what's needed. I'll tell you what else is needed while we've got you, Kevin. You have gone the way with the Macro Tourist newsletter, which has been one of the most popular newsletters in the industry. You started the way a lot of people do with uh, freebie, and of course now it is a paid subscription. How about just for that one issue that I had reacted to on Twitter, which was really excellent, Can we talk you into sharing that one with our Macro Voices listeners as a free trial? Sure. Sounds great. We'll include it in the roundup. All right. So the Research Roundup will have a link to Kevin's paid subscription newsletter that I was reacting to. And I I totally get where you're coming from. And I want to make sure I emphasize to our listeners, when it comes to having your pulse on the market and knowing one step ahead of the market, where they're headed next. You're much better at that, Kevin, than I will ever be. And I really respect your view. If you say up is the next move, I bet you're going to be right. And uh, one of these days, you'll see the big picture. And so will the rest of the market. And then it's going to be a big down. (laughs) Well, thanks for having me, Eric and Patrick. It's been a pleasure being on your show. This episode was made possible by TopTradersOnplug.com. Remember to get the ultimate guide to the best investing books ever written at toptradersunplug.com forward slash macro guide. For information on sponsoring Macro Voices, please visit macrovoices.com forward slash sponsor info. Listeners, be sure to register a free account at macrovoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our research roundup email, which provides you with all of the best free content that we could find on the internet each week, including downloads associated with our guest appearances, as well as, of course, our post-game chart books. Patrick, tell them what they missed in this week's research roundup. In the research roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the charts we just discussed with Kevin in the postgame. There's also a link to an article discussing Charlie McElligot's quantitative look at today's market, as well as a Jim Bianco article on this being one of the biggest moments of truth in financial market history. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners. And we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. 
and the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.